Well, welcome back as we continue our study in the book of Acts. And tonight we are in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 41, with a sermon I've titled, Peter at the Pulpit. Peter at the Pulpit. Now this morning we heard from the first uh, 13 verses of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. It's experiencing the fullness of God, and we saw that there's a difference between what we think of God in our minds and how we really experience Him in our lives. And that experience comes from from his holy spirit and we see that detailed in the word now in this previous message we saw in acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 13 we saw the holy spirit flood the scene and thousands of people from nations all across the world the known world at that time heard the gospel proclaimed in their own language this is in an in a sense a reversal of what took place at the tower of babel where where the the languages were confused and people couldn't stand one another this right here in acts chapter 2 we see kind of god reversing that shifting that back to the way that it's going to be one day where we all with one tongue praise the lord jesus christ and so we had this instance taking place in jerusalem the the holy spirit is making his presence very well known and it's leading the crowd that's there to come up with their own conclusions as to just why is this taking place just why is this happening and this led peter to preach to stand up and preach his first sermon did you know the first ever recorded sermon in the church age belongs to peter now, this is not the first, the first recorded sermon in the New Testament. We know that others have preached. Jesus preached and taught many times previously in the New Testament. But in the church age, when I say church age, I mean that's the time after Jesus ascended into heaven. The honor of the first ever sermon in the church age belongs to Peter. And we're going to see a number of sermons throughout the book of Acts in our time together. And I want to talk just about a few of them uh, briefly before we dive into Peter's very first sermon. But there's a book that I would love to recommend to you. It's called The Message of the New Testament. Now, there's, there's two books like this. There's The Message of the New Testament and The Message of the Old Testament uh, by a pastor named Mark Dever. Uh, And this is an incredible resource for having an overview, getting a big picture of what's taking place in each book of the Bible. And in in this book, The Message of the New Testament, again, one that I would recommend to you, I I gleaned several things from Mark Dever in, in putting this sermon together today. One is that the book of Acts has 42 different testimonies that are, that are, uh, basically sermons or sermonettes that are teaching about Jesus. The book of Acts has 42 testimonies to the gospel. And within it, there are 10 different sermons. There's 10 sermons. And of those 10 sermons in the book of Acts, can you guess who preached the majority of them? Was it Paul? Was it Peter? Was it Matthew? Was it, was it one of the other disciples? The answer is our boy, Peter. Peter preached a majority of the sermons contained in the book of Acts. In fact, Peter has five sermons in the book of Acts. As a close runner-up, the next person that has the most number of sermons in the book of Acts is Paul. And we're going we're gonna to follow him later on. The book of Acts is kind of divided into two different, two different main characters that it follows around. The first part of the book of Acts, the first half almost, is follows around Peter and a lot of the other disciples. The latter half follows Paul. So it's natural that Peter and Paul had the most sermons recorded in the book. And then there's another guy named Stephen who preaches later on in, in uh, the book of Acts, and then he's killed <laughs> for, what, for what he said. We'll see that later on in a couple of weeks. So those are the 10 sermons in the book of Acts. There's also 30 different preaching summaries that, that are contained, and these are where Luke has simply summed up what's, what somebody was saying at a certain place and a certain time uh, in the book of Acts. Now, in the book, the, the message, the sermons, the testimonies, they, they often fall on three main points. They keep coming back to these three main points over and over again. They hit these three same topics, and these topics are Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. And most of these testimonies, they start with the life of Jesus, but they don't spend a lot of time there because we have other Gospels that cover that. If you look at Jesus' death, we see that this is really the main emphasis of the book of Acts because this, 
This just happened just a few weeks ago before a lot of things, especially in the beginning of the book of Acts, took place. Jesus' death. While if you and I read a biography today, most biographies talk about the life of the person and, and it's very short towards their death. The main focus of these teachings about Jesus were on his death. So we have Jesus' life, we have Jesus' death, but by far, by far, the undisputed center of the teachings in the book of Acts, the sermons of, of what the message that the early church was taking out to the ends of the earth had to do with the resurrection of our King Jesus. It had to do with the resurrection. The, his resurrection is mentioned in at least 18 of these 30 different testimonies regarding Christ, regarding Christ and the message of the book of Acts. And these prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the risen Lord who's alive, who's working on our behalf even today. And so let's lean into to Acts chapter 2, to Peter's sermon. And one thing I want us to see before, as we're leaning in, about to start reading, is this. Peter takes this topic of the resurrection, and he treats it as a given. He's not making an, an apology for it. He's, he's not having to, to convince the crowd that was there that, that Jesus rose from the dead. He's treating it as a given. Peter's doesn't have to argue for the resurrection as if people there are skeptical about it. No, Peter argues from the resurrection. And this is because it was assumed in Jerusalem at this time just about everybody, whether they followed Christ or whether they didn't follow Christ, whether they believed or they didn't believe, they knew that the resurrection had just taken place. This is assumed. And so keep that in mind as we dive into Acts chapter 2, starting in, in verse 14, as we read the very first sermon of the church age. Now remember, the, the Holy Spirit had just went all across those in Jerusalem. The people are starting to come up with their own ideas as to what just took place. And this leads Peter to stand up and say, no, 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 no. This is the reason why. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14. I'll read verses 14 and 15. The Bible says this, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, addressed the crowd. He said, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. And here, this is where Peter begins his sermon. And his sermon is broken up into two main parts. The two main parts of, of the very first sermon recorded in the church age are this. The first part, verses 14 through 21, it explains the events of Pentecost. Peter's going to take the next seven verses and say, this is why you've just noticed this happened. This is why these things are taking place. That's the first half of the sermon. The second half, the second part of the sermon is this. Jesus is, or Peter is proclaiming the risen Lord. He's proclaiming that Jesus has rose from the dead, and this is the result of Jesus rising from the dead. And then in the last few verses, we'll note the crowd's response to the very first sermon preached in the church age. Now, I want you to notice something as we dive right into this. I want you to notice the confidence that Peter has. Look at his confidence. It says, Peter stood up, lifted up his voice, and addressed the people with great confidence. Now, if you know anything about Peter, this is a stark contrast to what we know about Peter, to what the Bible, how the Bible describes Peter throughout the Gospels. This is a completely different man than the one that sank in the Sea of Galilee that Jesus had to, to reach in and pull out of the water. I love that picture of Peter's view from, from under the water, Jesus standing on the water about to pull him up. This is, this is a different Peter. This is a different man than, than the Peter who just a few weeks ago compared himself to John beside the sea. Jesus told John and told the others how, basically how they are going to die, how their life is going to end. And, and Peter wanted to compare himself still to another leader of the disciples, to John. This is a, a different Peter than the one who chopped a guard's ear off when Jesus was about to be taken and, and, and captured and eventually crucified. This is a different Peter. We see that the Holy Spirit has had a tremendous impact on him right here and right now. Now, this is not to say that Peter was perfect. This is not to say that anybody who's a believer, who 
uh, has the Spirit of God living within them, who, as Ephesians says, is sealed with the Spirit. This does not mean that, one, we stop sinning, and two, that we live a perfect life. No, no, no. The Bible makes that clear. We all still continue to sin. We all still need to ask for forgiveness of that sin. We mess up. The Bible makes that clear with Peter. If you look at Galatians chapter 2, you see that Paul had to rebuke Peter for, for separating himself from, from other believers one day. Paul had to rebuke him. So this is not to say Peter was perfect, but this, this is to say there has been a noticeable change in the life of Peter. Let's continue. Verse 16, Peter says this, But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. Now this crowd has already seen kind of a, a glimpse of these things. They've already seen a glimpse. They've, they've felt the earth tremble through an earthquake when Jesus died on the cross. They saw darkness in the middle of the day when Jesus yielded up his spirit. They've, they've experienced a taste of these things, and so they know, they, they can recall quite easily exactly what, what Peter is quoting to them through the prophet Joel, because they've experienced a taste of some of those, and they, they know from reading the Old Testament here that what they experienced was just a taste. It's going to be far worse, far more radical in the end on the day of the Lord. Now, Peter met Joel, met and quoted Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And in doing so, he reminded the audience from the Old Testament, from a book that they revered, that we're in what he calls the last days. And these last days were ushered in through the, when Jesus came and lived on earth. That's the, that was the beginning of them. The book, book of Hebrews makes this clear. Hebrews chapter 1, the very first two verses in the book of Hebrews say this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, like Joel. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. I want you to know that we are living in the last days. And what the Bible calls the last days, these have lasted nearly 2,000 years. We don't know how long they're going to continue to last, but we know right now we are in the last days. And in verses 19 and 20, Peter recalls the things that are going to take place before the second coming of Christ. And after having experienced some of these a little bit, after hearing the words of the prophet Joel, the crowd would want to know how they could avoid being in the midst of such calamity. They want to know how they could be okay when when this great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And Peter uses this. He he has his audience tuned in. They're tracking with them with him now. He's he's used a, a text that they revere. He's met his crowd where they are. And now he's going to get the gospel to them. He's going to share the good news with them. And Peter uses verse 21 as kind of a hinge verse to. to to really teach his crowd and lean into what his his main points of his sermon are going to be. Peter says this, he says, And it shall come to pass, or Joel says this, Peter quotes, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now remember, Peter's sermon's in two parts. The first part is explaining the events of Pentecost. The second part that we're now going to lean into is he's going to proclaim the risen Lord. This is how you're saved. This is how you're saved. Joel says, call upon the name of the Lord in order to not uh, be in the midst of all this calamity that's going to come on the great day of the Lord. The crowd says, how do we do that? Who do we do that through? Peter's going to remind them just who that Lord is and just how he can save them. And John MacArthur notes that Peter's sermon is laid out in a four main bold points and we're gonna we're gonna follow that that today 
the four points of Peter's sermon are this. One, Peter starts, starts talking about the life of Jesus. He talks about the life of Jesus. He doesn't dedicate a ton of time to it because a lot of people knew it. He's going to talk about the death of Jesus. Again, he's not going to dedicate a lot of time to it. But then he is really going to lean in to the resurrection of Jesus and then lean in to the exaltation of Jesus. And so those are going to be our four points for our time together right now. We're going to look at the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Christ, and then his exaltation. So let's, let's look at the life of Jesus from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. The Bible says this. Peter's still teaching. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Now let's take a pause right there. We need to break that verse down just a little bit. Peter names three things that during Jesus's life were to simply prove that he was who he said he was. Peter reminds the crowd, hey, you had Three years of evidence, three years of Jesus doing incredible, miraculous, radical things that simply proved who he was. And so Peter names these three things. He says, you've seen three things. You've seen one, you've seen mighty works, and you've seen wonders. There's been wonders around Jesus, and there's been signs. And I want to break that down for you, because all these things, these three don't mean the same thing. They mean different things. One, let's talk about mighty works. Mighty works can be translated miracles. Mighty works are miracles. They are the supernatural works of Jesus that, that he did with crowds around him. He could walk on water. He could feed the 5,000. He could uh, turn water into wine. He could heal people of their diseases. He could bring people back from the dead. Those are, that's what Peter says here. You saw these mighty works of Jesus. Secondly, and these, and these works, let me back up. These works were to point to Christ. They were to point to him that I'm, I'm the one. Don't get caught up in the works. Get caught up in who is doing the works. These works point to me and that I am who I say I am. And John MacArthur, he says, it should come as no surprise if the God who supernaturally created the universe should choose at times to supernaturally intervene in it. We know that this world was created from nothing. That's a supernatural event. And if this world was created supernaturally, it should be no surprise to us that God who created the world can still do and does supernatural things in this world he created here and today. That's what Peter's pointing them to and saying, look at, the, look at the mighty works that Jesus did. That should point you to God through his son. Second, Peter talks about wonders. Now, a wonder is a reaction to the works. It's a reaction. The, the wonder describes the, the reaction of those that saw the mighty, wor the mighty works. Wonder could be translated kind of, kind of a marveling. It's a marveling at at uh, either a, a miracle that Christ performed or something he taught. And if you read the Gospels, the Gospels are full of occasions where the crowd and the apostles marveled at what Jesus did. And Peter's reminding them of that, saying, crowd, many of you have probably marveled at something Jesus said or taught or did. And then finally, we see signs. Peter says, God attested Jesus to you with mighty works, wonders, and signs. A sign is a work of God. It's a work of God. Signs are miraculous works that God does to prove the deity of Christ. And if, again, if you look through the Gospels, we see signs are all over the place. Think back to kind of towards the beginning of, of the ministry of Jesus when he was baptized. When he was baptized and came out of the water, one, an audible voice was heard that said, This is my son, whom I am well pleased. And two, uh, the, the spirit looking like a dove, not a dove, but a looking like a dove, landed and, and, and stayed and rested upon Jesus. That was a sign. Remember when Jesus uh, died on the cross, lit, yielded up his spirit, the sky was darkened. The, the veil from the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, not bottom to top where it could have been cut by somebody, but from top to bottom. These were signs that proved, God proving that Jesus is who he says he is. And many of the crowd had seen at least one of these things. They've seen 
one of the miracles that Jesus performed, the, the mighty works. They've, they've wondered at what he said or done, and they've seen the signs of God. This is why Peter reminds the crowd. He says in the last part of verse 22, he says, Just as you yourselves know, this is the guy. This is the guy. And then Peter moves on to, to the next verse, verse 23, and talking about the death of Jesus. He moves on to even though the crowd knew all of these things that pertain to who Jesus was, they still put him to death. Look at verse 23. Peter says this, This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. He says, You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Now, we're not going to lean into to this verse too much, but I, I do want you to see that in this verse, there is a holy, a biblical tension. There's a tension between God's sovereignty and man's free will actions. You see, God used evil men to accomplish his purpose, yet in doing so, he never violated their will. God, the Bible never gives us that option to say that that was an option. Pastor Johnny Hunt says this about this verse. He says, in here, in this verse, in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, Peter presents the total sovereignty of God alongside the complete responsibility of man. He's, Johnny says, men are not responsible for God's plans, but they're responsible for their own sins. And that's, that's kind of what we see here. And Peter, again, in this verse, is reminding the crowd that because of their unbelief that led them to a certain action, they will be guilty before that great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. And he could have ended there. He could have stopped there and said, you guys figure it out. You're guilty. You know you are. I just proved it. Go figure it out. But no, that's, that leaves no room for the gospel. The gospel is the good news. Peter just gave the bad news. Here's the good news. You're not stuck in that guilt. You're not trapped there. There's a way out through one who has done something on your behalf, and that's Jesus. And Peter dedicates the next eight or so verses to talk about the resurrection of Jesus, further proof of who he's, he is, who he says he is, and there is hope um, of life after death. Look at verse 24. Peter says this. He says this, this Jesus, God raised him up, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then Peter goes back to one of the Old Testament prophets, one of the major kings of the Old Testament, the major figures. He quotes David. He says, for David says concerning him, concerning Jesus, he says, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced and my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David. This is, this is Peter again. He says that David, he both died and he was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. We know where David's buried. We can go see it. But then Peter says, being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he should set one of his descendants on his throne, he, David, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And then again, look at Peter, how Peter reminds the crowd that th many of them have seen and noticed this. He says, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. And this is the main point of Peter's sermon. This is the main point. He says, Jesus is not dead. He's alive. You put him to death, but God raised him again. The main point is this. David's dead, but Jesus is alive. David, who wrote this? Who am I quoting? He's dead. We know where his tomb is. We can go and see it. But this Jesus is alive. And to further confirm this, Peter continues to lean in a little bit about just why King David wrote what he wrote about Jesus. He, he leans in. Again, he's quoting Psalm chapter 16. He leans in. He says, even though David's dead, David knew he was going to die. But God told David that one day there's going to come a descendant from you whose kingdom will never end. David, your kingdom's going to end. But there's going to be one of your descendants whose kingdom is never going to end. 
also his flesh is not going to see corruption. That means Jesus' kingdom that he's, he ushered in, starting kind of in, in this church age, this kingdom is going to last forever. And this Jesus, although he's going to die, he's not going to stay dead. He's not going to stay dead. He's going to rise again. God tells David this in 2 Samuel. I want to read it to you. God says this to David in 2 Samuel. He says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, that means you're going to die. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That's how God separates and tells David, hey, this isn't going to be one of your sons that I'm talking about. This is my son whose kingdom I'm going to establish. He's not going to continue yours. It's my kingdom that I'm going to establish through him. And then again, Peter, in verse 32, he leans back into the crowd. He says, hey, all of the disciples, all of us, and many of you, you have seen Jesus risen from the dead. He's, he's arguing from fact. He's, he's not proving this. He's saying, you remember just a few days ago, you've seen him risen from the dead. I love what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians. He reminds the people that Jesus appeared to over 500 people. Jesus saw over 500 people. They saw him in the time between his resurrection and his ascension. And so if, if you're in the crowd at this point, if you've seen Jesus risen, or at least heard from somebody that he has been, if you've heard Peter kind of weave his way through the Old Testament and show that it's our fault that Jesus was put to death. Uh, that's the reason we're here. He's the reason this Holy Spirit has kind of swept upon and we've heard the good news presented in our languages. If Peter leans up to this point in verse 32 and says, you've seen Jesus risen, I think one of your questions would be, well, okay, Peter, if Jesus is alive, then where is he? Can you, can you just present him right now? Where, where is Jesus? And that leads Peter to the fourth point of his sermon, which is his final answer, his final thoughts on Jesus, which is his exaltation. Look at verse 33. Peter says, Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Peter's saying, hey, Jesus is at the right hand of God right now. Jesus is the one who sent his spirit right now. That's why this is taking place, crowd. And then he, go, he continues to quote David. He says, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but David says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So where's Jesus Right now, Jesus is at the right hand of God. David even told, uh, God even told David, David even called him Lord. David even called him Lord. David's kingdom wasn't the great kingdom, although it was great. The kingdom of Jesus is the greatest kingdom, the ultimate kingdom. Jesus is the, the great king, the great Lord. And so where's Jesus right now? He's at the right hand of God. That's where he was during this time in the book of Acts. That's where he is right now today. He's at the right hand of God making intercession for you and for I, hearing the prayers of the saints that are carried up through the Holy Spirit. But he's not going to stay there forever. One day he's going to return and fully usher in his kingdom that will never end. Now Peter's sermon is finished here. He's finished in Acts chapter 2, verse, verse 36. Now it's the crowd's turn to speak. And look, look what the crowd says in regards to this sermon. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, Now when they, when the crowd heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, they said, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And then the Bible says, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort the crowd, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And the Bible says, so those 
who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Let's lean into just a few things as we conclude our time together. One, John MacArthur notes specifically about Peter calling the crowd to repent and be baptized. MacArthur says, by calling on each to be baptized, Peter doesn't allow for any secret disciples. Peter doesn't allow room for somebody to quietly and privately come to Jesus. If you read the rest of the New Testament, following Christ is a public endeavor. Following Christ is something where we die to ourselves and raise again, being united with him through his death, burial, and resurrection. And baptism's one of the ways that we publicly show that we are united with Christ. Baptism for this crowd would mark a public break with Judaism. And it mark identification with, with this Jesus. It wouldn't be easy, but it follows the command of the Holy Spirit through the apostles, sp specifically Peter right here. Johnny Hunt further leans in on this idea. He says, the idea of an unbaptized believer does not seem to be entertained in the New Testament. The idea of an unbaptized believer does not seem to be entertained in the New Testament. Now we know that baptism doesn't earn your salvation. We know that baptism is not a step on the way to salvation. We know from God's word that baptism happens because one is already saved, because one is already united to Christ, and now their identity lies with Christ Jesus. Johnny Hunt also leans in a little bit more about just helping us put our, put our idea of where, where the crowd is at this moment. Think about this. He says, it's difficult for modern readers to grasp the magnitude of the change facing Peter's Jewish hearers. They were a part of a unique community with a rich cultural and religious history. Despite long years of subjugation to Rome, the crowd here was fiercely nationalistic. And this nation, this crowd that had rejected Jesus as a blasphemer and executed him just a few short weeks ago, now Peter, listen, he's saying, the one you just executed is the one that you need to embrace because he's the only one that can save you from this great and terrible day of the Lord. That's, that's big. And if you're in the crowd, that's going to get your attention. But as verse 41 tells us, that got the crowd's attention. And through God's plan, around 3,000 people put their faith in King Jesus that day. They repented of their sins, and they were on their way towards being baptized. 3,000 people at least came to faith in Christ in the very first recorded sermon of the church age. And as we'll see later from the book of Acts, this wasn't always the case. There's a, there's a lot of people in the book of Acts who, upon preaching by Peter or an apostle or, or Paul or Stephen or somebody else, they, they were convinced and they repented. There's some that were dismissive. There's some that were, were furious. And there's others that just kind of shook it off. They were apathetic. They were unconcerned. And that's kind of how people respond to preaching 2,000 years later, still in the church age here today. Some hear it, some are convinced, some repent, some are angry, and some are unconcerned. So as we close our time together, I want, you, I want to ask you, what's your reaction? What's your response to hearing the gospel proclaimed through God's word today? We'll see you next time. Let's pray together before we close. Father, I thank you for your word thank you that we could spend time studying the very first sermon in the church age, and I pray that your spirit will use it to affect our hearts, to draw us closer to you each and every day. Lord, we thank you for our great King Jesus, and we ask this in his name. Amen.